Well, hello. <clears throat> That's me again. It's uh, April 26, 2022, and I think it's time for me to do a sort of Q&A session. <clears throat> and uh, today I'm going to be answering some questions which I uh, collected and kind of uh, generalized from a number of my videos, the discussion boards and comments which have been left and uh, primarily I left them in their original form bar some you know necessary changes in terms of uh, <coughs> basic grammar but uh, the reason uh, it relates to pretty much all, all comments to all my videos is uh, because if they are kind of like collective, so to speak, aggregate questions, because many of similar questions have been asked before. And uh, the last questions I uh, collected from the last couple or three, especially uh, uh, um, comment sections from my videos, they reflect pretty much uh, same uh, uh, questions over and over again, just stated differently. So in this case, uh, some people will recognize uh, their, uh, th their questions, how they formulated them. So, but okay, let's start with uh, <clears throat> dealing with those questions. And um, I will start with the first one. Let me read it uh, uh, for you. So guys, if you don't see your specific names who uh, uh, posted this question, so as I already explained, they are very similar from other users too. So just don't be you know, insulted or offended by the fact that I don't uh, call your names. And uh, so here we are. Given the economic war of attrition, I am puzzled why Russia is being so soft, especially given Russia's strange hold over Europe. It's not leveraging this power to demand perhaps no weapons transfer to Ukraine or list the return of its stolen reserves. Well, let me start with the <clears throat> simple explanation. Uh, the war uh, Russia conducts, or so special military operation, is not against Ukraine per se. It, obviously, there's a Nazi regime there, and uh, even Western media begin to admit this now. But it's uh, the war between uh, combined West and Russia, and the uh, forces of the Eurasian integration, which it represents. And in this case, uh, what I can say only, uh, no matter what Russia does, the West is hell-bent by, for different reasons, uh, pri prim uh, primary reason of them, it's incompetence and just pure evil of its elites, is that um, no matter what Russia says or does, uh, the West will continue to deliver weapons. And Russia will continue to annihilate them. And uh, uh, obviously, as long as it stays, uh, you know, uh, relatively peaceful between NATO and Russia, and it's mostly proxy on the Western part, that's how it will remain until basically the operation is over. And then the other phase will start in terms of settling the, uh, how to, so, so to speak, the new world order, if you wish. Uh, the fact that Russia does have leverage doesn't mean that Russia will uh, necessarily uh, uh, stop its long-term contracts. Having said all that, though, the uh, news uh, or information space today is uh, absolutely uh, you know, going bananas from the news that uh, Polish um, gas company, main Polish ga gas company, uh, stated that Gazprom basically sh shut down the valve. Well, uh, Gazprom after that went out and the bank debunked it, you know, and said, no, we didn't shut anything off. But I think so, this uh, statement from Polish main gas supplier who imports gas from Russia is actually uh, well founded because Gazprom stated that Poland refused to pay in rubles or use the scheme of transferring uh, hard currency funds to Gazprom Bank and wait until they convert it to rubles and then getting its gas. So uh, Gazprom said we didn't shut it off, but uh, evidently the shutting off gas or deliveries of gas to Poland are coming. So it could be tomorrow, it could be after tomorrow, but it looks like it's the done deal. And uh, uh, Poland wanted it and Poland was one of the main driver behind this whole rearrangement 
with the uh, whatever the number of the package energy packages in Europe are, whatever the stupidest uh, uh, ideas you know uh, embedded in them. But it, it was Poland who wanted to say, hey, don't use those long-term contracts, uh, you know, with those damn Ruskies, you know, whom we hate guts, you know. And uh, they said, that, yeah, let's do the spot pricing. Let's market, define the, you know, and establish the price. Well, you know what happened after that? The price of gas went up, I don't know, five, six times. So you got what you wanted. And we'll see now what is, what is going to happen with Poland. But I think so. The gas deliveries will be shut down. And Poland will be the first and probably the demonstrate uh, exhibit A kind of you know, uh, case um, to uh, show for the rest of the world what happens when you do not follow Russian uh, instructions and desires, so to speak, you know, in terms of uh, paying for Russia's main exports. Uh, obviously, uh, Mr. Blinken, I believe, and uh, other people from the uh, from the United States, they wanted uh, actually Russia supply gas for free. So Russia supplies the gas and uh, doesn't get paid. Well, th that doesn't work like this, obviously. And so uh, probably we have to wait and see what's going to happen with Poland and how uh, uh, it all develops from there. <clears throat> But yeah, there is also the fact that Russia is making a killing, and that's the final, uh, I mean, conclusion, and if you wish, uh, in my response to this question, is the fact that West is financing Russia's operation in Ukraine, and that's simple as that, and that's what drives them completely nuts. If it wasn't bad enough for them that Russia already demands rubles for that, well, now they understand they uh, finance that and nothing they can do about it. Why would Russia shut off uh, gas from uh, you know, to uh, people or to customers who pay? Germany pays, somebody else pays in Europe, so, and, you know, why not? So that's the answer to this question. I hope so it works for you guys, If and I hope you uh, deem it, you know, be, be, uh, as being answered properly. Now, here's another question. Greetings from Croatia. Dangerous times ahead, but I believe with God on our side, we have nothing to fear, Mr. Martianov. I'm sure you have heard of the op operation of Fatima and the special role of Russia to play in the future. What do you think of it? Um, okay, let me put it this way. I respect people uh, of faith. Doesn't matter what kind of faith, you know, it could be, uh, you know, Russian or Eastern Orthodox, Catholics, you know, people, you know, in Islam, uh, you know, all kinds of religions and people of faith, and if you have the uh, really uh, some uh, good message there, so sh sure, I respect you, but you have to keep in mind, but I would have been uh, um, um, defined in the Western paradigm as the uh, agnostic with the uh, uh, leaning more towards the atheism but not militant atheism i respect religious and uh, religions and i understand how important they are in people's uh, lives and uh, also including the massive and important therapeutic uh, 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 effect of, on those but I am really kind of not into those signs, you know, there are all kinds of signs, obviously, and we can always, you know, tie them to one or another event. But because I am this uh, fairly materialistic guy in, uh, in, in what I do, I have to always look at the geopolitical, economic and military uh, element of everything. And uh, there is no doubt that Russia is the pivot uh, around which the <clears throat> uh, Eurasian... Uh, uh, um, alliance is forming, and it's Russia's military, Russia's military power, and some really outstanding leads in a number of technologies, not just uh, uh, military ones, but uh, civilian ones, and uh, formation of this common market in uh, uh, this gigantic common market in Eurasia, which dwarfs anything that uh, European Union together with the United States can represent, um, is uh, obviously Russia has a very important role to play here. And in this case, it's probably the um, uh, main role for Russia in the coming uh, uh, century. But I want to point out also this important fact, which I spoke on a number of occasions and I wrote the books. Truth is, what we knew about uh, classic uh, uh, Western civilization, 
and European civilization, it is gone in Europe, it's done, it's over. But it is in Russia that many fundamental principles of uh, uh, Europe and Western civilization are being today uh, stored and, you know, uh, safely stored and preserved. And these are obviously such issues as uh, critical thinking, you know, and uh, basically Russia is not post-Christian. It is still very Christian, but it's a little bit different. It's difficult to explain to people who have never really touched upon that, what is happening in Russia in terms of in spiritual sense. And it's, uh, but one thing I can uh, tell you, you have to look up the main cathedral of Russian armed forces. And even the visuals and uh, the message what is there will tell you everything you need to know about uh, how Russians view themselves and why uh, and how they define the role of Russia in the coming world. It is important. And of course, the other thing is that, yeah, as uh, Western economists from the Wall Street used to uh, say that, yeah, Russia is like 2-3% of uh, world GDP. Well, guess what? This 2-3% world GDP country just by uh, doing some things in the economic field shook their uh, global market. So there you go. So figure, uh, yourself out, figure out yourself what is the real size of Russian economy. I can give you just a hint. It's much larger than Germany's. So, I hope so that I answered this question, and again, it's kind of more metaphysical, and so what can I say? It is what it is, guys. Now, next question. Could Russia prevail in a war against the U.S. fought with conventional weapons only? Well, you have to look up uh, my previous videos, and I actually touch upon this issue, and I... Uh, when speaking about it, and I wrote about it, read my second book, it's all about basically how to fight conventionally. And uh, when people uh, ask me this question, and this question has been asked, you know, many times, I always use the uh, analogy of, again, two of my favorite, uh, among of them, one late Alan Holdsworth, uh, you know, absolutely my favorite guitar players, and I will repeat it again, uh, John McLaughlin, Mahavishnu himself and Alan Horsworth, they had their sort of interviewing each other, this discussion, uh, which was later published, I believe, in the guitar magazine, but uh, it could be some other magazine, but it's an important musical magazine, and in which they were discussing the guitar playing. And both are virtuosos and amazing guitar players, and both came down to this same conclusion, that in the end, it's how you play acoustic guitar which really matters. Because even electric guitar with all these distortions and sustains can sometimes hide, uh, you know, the uh, inefficiencies and um, lack of the uh, mastery of the instrument behind all those sound effects. Uh, well, there are obviously many great git guitar players who play electric, like Joe Satriani or Steve Vai, who are amazing, and they keep playing, uh, you know, acoustic. But uh, both Alan Holdsworth and uh, John McLaughlin agreed that, oh yeah, you have to do acoustic first, and then that's how you judge it. Well, guess what? Same goes for the warfare. You cannot fight the nuclear war, really. I mean, there were some uh, uh, strategies and uh, doctrines, you know, pu uh, pushed forth, you know, at some point of time that, oh yeah, we can do the limited uh, uh, nuclear war and, you know, yeah, you can fight theoretically the war with tactical nukes as long as it doesn't go to uh, the full nuclear threshold and then exchange starts and the, with the strategic uh, nuclear weapons. But the point is, everything what really matters in modern geopolitics, under the auspices, under the uh, umbrella, so to speak, of the nuclear deterrent and mutually assured destruction, is how you fight conventionally. That's the only thing which matters. And that is why I'm on record since probably, yeah, a long time ago, okay? When I state that, no, United States cannot win Russia in Europe, let alone in Eastern Europe. 
because it's going to be just absolutely ground to a halt with larger losses uh, for Russian forces, of course, but because uh, no NATO country, in, especially the United States, has any type of the uh, weapon systems and uh, air defense which can uh, prevent it from being destroyed, basically, uh, you know, having all, all uh, rear uh, uh, services and headquarters uh, not destroyed. It, they will be destroyed because there is nothing that NATO, uh, uh, nothing NATO has which can intercept basically what the Russians already demonstrated in Ukraine on the uh, pretty substantial scale just doing the stand of weapons blowing stuff and blowing the uh, both uh, um, military and some uh, important uh, infrastructure for the lines of communications such as the railways substa substations which provide the uh, electrical thrust so to speak the pulling force for the uh, uh, trains which delivered prior to that the uh, supplies to the surrounded uh, VSU grouping. So, uh, and when you look at Russian air defense and uh, I mean, read uh, Mr. Achmanek, he is the uh, run big honcho on the uh, air operations and uh, read people who, who do not have their uh, heads in their asses and you will recognize that basically the uh, United States will sustain uh, losses which it never faced before in its history. It will be much larger than the losses United States sustained in the uh, World War II. And knowing the propensity and bias of the United States and the fact that it already used it towards the use of the nuclear weapons, uh, you can bet your ass on the fact that United States, once it gets uh, in a couple of weeks, first uh, 40, 50,000 KIAs, um, yeah, they probably will go nuclear because they will not be able to fight uh, conventionally. And that is really a, pretty much the paradigm some people in Pentagon understand. And uh, you can read uh, among many other people, but obviously Douglas McGregor's uh, famous piece in the Time magazine 2011, uh, where he uh, basically speaks about the, uh, well, very limited use for the U.S. Marine Corps in real war. And read attentively what he's uh, writing there about uh, the losses United States will sustain. So, and yes, United States never fought with such losses in modern war. It will be a catastrophe not to speak about the fact that uh, pretty much uh, most of the uh, carrier battle groups will be sunk. This is a shocking development in terms of what United uh, U.S. public uh, expects, you know, from the performance of its army. And this is the reality, and uh, as I already stated, my second book really addresses this issue really well, although the first one I also touch upon this. So that's another answer. So no, United States cannot win war against Russia, uh, around Russia in its near uh, uh, geographic vicinity. The rest, Russia doesn't care. I mean, whatever West does to itself, as long as there is an iron curtain and, uh, you know, Russia has enough weapons to wipe it, uh, the West out, so it's... Russians don't care. So that's the answer for this question. Let's go with the next question. <clears throat> Just found your channel and subscribed. Are you on uh, um, uh, VK, which is VK, I mean, uh, it, it, which is called In Contact of Contacti or other platforms? if when YouTube cancels your account. Well, YouTube certainly can cancel my account. That's not excluded, but I mean, uh, I am on Odyssey and I have account on InVK, but it's pretty empty. And other than that, I don't have any social media accounts. I don't have Facebook account. I don't have uh, whatever Instagram account. I don't have the, what's the, this big thing, Twitter account. Uh, so I, I just don't have those. So. I just do my thing on YouTube. If YouTube shuts me down, well, I'll be on Odyssey and you can always visit my blog and, uh, you know, so it's, um, unless of course we have the complete 1984 descending upon us and then, yeah, they will take me, you know, into some room 101 and do whatever, you know, so anyhow, that's what it is. Next. Um, okay, now here comes this thing which I really have issues with. The Moskva 
mean missile cruiser had no business operating so close to the coast. It was not designed for that purpose. The Moskva was designed to operate on high seas with the purpose of providing air defense and striking carrier battle groups with its anti-ship missiles. Corvettes and LCS are designed for coastal lobs. The RF Admiralty screwed up big time. No, it didn't screw, uh, screw it up and uh, the other thing which is like bizarrely correct is yeah, Moskva in, uh, in 1970s was designed with its fort uh, air defense system to be the uh, uh, air defense uh, kind of core of the uh, task group uh, but who said that it cannot be done uh, near uh, shores so yeah but in terms of in fact is uh, even the all the Vulcan uh, anti-shipping guided missiles which have the range of around 1000 kilometers their reserve functions their reserve mode as it is with any kind of uh, Russian uh, anti-shipping missiles is always a land attack you could land attack, not with high precision, but you can land attack even with the good old P5, P6, P35 of the 1950s design. So, what was Moskva doing there near Zmiini? We don't know. That's the whole point. How can you judge what admirals, or basically the uh, uh, main staff of uh, um, the Navy, Russian Navy, screw up, screwed up or not? We don't know all facts. Let's wait until they release those facts. Let's see what happened. And in this particular case, and again, I gave, uh, 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 you can look it up in my past videos, I gave the, so to speak, you know, review of the, context of what Moskva was doing in that area and what were the circumstances. I am not going to speculate here. I'm not going to provide my hypothesis about what have happened until I have reliable data, until I have something which is made and statement made by Russian Ministry of Defense. Believe me, they will tell you what have happened. Eventually, the Kursk disaster doesn't have any more really uh, mystery about it. It's pretty damn clear what have happened there, and uh, the same gonna happen to the uh, to Moskva. But if in any way the NATO-based forces have been involved, be that uh, which I don't think so, it happened. But hey, who knows if that uh, you know have been. Uh, uh, anti-shipping missiles or diversionary forces you know what we'll see what happens after that I mean so Russia will respond if it is the case of the internal sabotage that no matter where Moscow Moscow could have been uh, uh, you know basically moored to the pier and still you know getting the issue you know with the fire and then detonating its uh, uh, most likely 130 millimeter shells but we don't know Okay, so let's not speculate. If you want to speculate and if you want to get into the old good old conspiracy theories, well, there are plenty uh, of uh, sources on that issue. You can go and get it in the uh, tweet on Twitter or some bizarre, you know, Russian resource. So I'm not going to continue uh, discussing this uh, uh, missile cruise on Moscow affair until it's really. Uh, uh, Russian Minister of Defense comes up with the uh, uh, basically uh, final, not final, or preliminary statement and we get all data and then we can make uh, any kind of uh, conclusions. Now, the sixth question, we continue and there was a, some uh, break up uh, in uh, my electronic equipment here for some reason, I don't know. So, uh, let's continue. And here's the, it's really kind of very uh, awkward uh, in terms of the uh, grammar, but let me get the gist of this uh, question. Mr. Martianov, I would like to see you touching on a subject that I think it is about time. I hear the West blaming mainstream media, the military industrial complex, deep state, industrial media, blah, blah, blah. My question is, isn't all these countries democracies? So there are two realities, or is democracy a front and all people in the West are slaves to the system, or all Western population is the one to blame because they elected these leaders. They watch and listen uh, to the channel they idolize, the experts, and if I'm not wrong, most of not all of them volunteer for their military service. And also, if the biggest power in the USA and a big part of the elites are Jewish, and we now have Nazis created, financed, and lived by Jews, 
And why they do it in the world not excluding Palestine? How do I reconcile all this if I get in trouble for saying Jew? So which one it is? I would love to hear your opinion on this. Well, it's a really funny um, formulated question, but I kind of get the, uh, so to speak, the main message, so to speak. And uh, here's the answer. First, in terms of democracies, no, the combined West is not democracy anymore. It's a sham. It's pretty much oligarchies, or oligarchy in larger sense, which uh, put forward this uni, uh, uni party, which is a neoliberal uni party, and the, only the wings of those uni party uh, kind of differ a little bit in terms of rhetoric and in terms of the social policies. So, no, and especially in terms of European Union, is becoming a uh, totalitarian society. United States, however, of, is, is, is different. United States is different in the sense that, yeah, it's still oligarchy, but there is a constitution, there is a bill of rights, which is law. Well, we, I say we in the United States, I'm your citizen, we are still protected by the constitution. We are still protected by the bill of rights, and by the first and second amendments and what have you, Europe doesn't have it. In the United States, the freedom of speech is uh, a law. They can try to intimidate you, they can even try to kill you, but it will be against the law. And you can still go out and shoot the hell out of anybody pretty much, even if they will try to sabotage you all the way, including all those corrupt lawyers and what have you. But Europe is different. It's not the law. There are only declarations about all those human rights. In reality, it's already a totalitarian society. Now, poor Jews. Uh, oh gosh, it's such a uh, uh, beaten to death uh, uh, topic. Let's start with first. I'm not going to go into the Palestine issue because first, I'm I'm not really good at it. I don't know all the, all the history there. And I'm not going to be defending Israel here, but you have to keep in mind that Israel, for all its crimes, some of it was crime, I mean, it has some legitimate uh, security uh, issues and security concerns. The same goes, for example, in Turkey, which is operating illegally in the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, in the Idlib province, and there are Turkomans, but let me tell you, Turkey does have uh, legitimate uh, security concerns because they're Kurds. So... And the same goes for the United States. United States did become evil empire since early 2000s. And guess what? It's bad. There are many bad things which the United States did. And there are many war criminals who are still in the uh, American elite. But even the United States has its legitimate economic uh, uh, interest and it has legitimate uh, security concerns. What are they? How they are defined? It's a completely different story. And yes, we can definitely state that there is a huge influence of Jewish lobby and uh, it's well documented. Again, uh, you can uh, buy and read book by John Merschheimer and Stephen Walt. It's called the Israeli lobby. And yeah, it's, uh, it's all there. There's no secret about it. And uh, Hollywood was basically created by Jews. And, you know, so there is no doubt that there is a powerful influence of Jewish lobby. But let's not also forget that while we may blame, and some of the blame probably will be uh, correct, and for example, among neocons, there are a bunch of, uh, you know, war criminals, basically. Uh, uh, that's who they are, many of them anyway. So uh, we have to remember, guys, the neocons have been brought to uh, to the world, so to speak, in a big way, and have been placed in the uh, government position. And by the way, not all of those neocons were actually Jews. Many of them are your clean-cut wasp, you know, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants or of other European uh, descent. They have been placed there, guess by who? It was Ronald Reagan on his watch where it all started. These people have been brought uh, into the day of the light, you know, uh, or light of the day, rather. And uh, there you go. You can see what happened. So, well, you see, you can say, oh, Jews subverted Reagan. No, they needed them. And that's what they did. And when you look now at uh, basically uh, uh, what the United States does in terms of foreign policy, well, hello. Do you remember such name as Bigniew Brzezinski? That's his uh, foreign policy doctrine, which is being implemented, including by the neocons, by the way. And Zbigniew Brzezinski was by no means Jew. In fact, I'm pretty sure he was pretty anti-Semitic, but he was a Polish guy. 
And the reason the United States finds itself today where it finds itself, and this whole war between not just Ukraine and Russia, it's just the part of it. It's an uh, important part, but it's just the part of a much larger conflict between the West and Russia. And this was conceived incompetently as usual, because basically everything what Brzezinski wrote was completely incompetent, and it was absolutely, uh, I mean, delirium. But it was conceived by this Polish guy, and he had many, many uh, people of not Jewish descent who actually supported him in this. And guess what? As I already stated, with this uh, uh, situation of this larger conflict between West and Russia, you can definitely see, if you go and look up US World News Report uh, uh, article about the don't ignore Poles and the Poles. It is about the Polish uh, and other Eastern European uh, communities, Hungarians, Czechs, Romanians, all those people who basically lobbied like crazy for the expansion of NATO, which is in the foundation, which is the main reason for what we have here today. And guess what? Guess who was the main champion of this expansion? It was not just Bigny Brzezinski. There were many, many people in of absolutely not Jewish descent, including in Clinton administration, who were pushing for that. And guess what? Here's the result. But if you say that, oh, they're Jews and they have influence, yeah, some of them do, definitely. Some of it is big, but also you have all kinds of Jews who actually, some of them, they, they don't like even Israel. And then, of course, you have the wonderful and uh, uh, wonderful Jewish scholars, like late Stephen Cohen. He was a Jew. He was the man I would have been proud to call, uh, you know, my friend. So it's all more complex than that. It's not black and white. It's not mine here. It's really complex. So let's not kind of concentrate on this. Let's, uh, but let's see for what uh, see it for what it is. And we have the complete remaking of the world order. And the Jews play the part in it. But I mean, come on, it's the combined West which has been, have been completely corrupted and which is facing now the decline, which it doesn't want to face. Hence, you are all those kind of the uh, convulsions and Ukraine and the war in Ukraine is just one part of it. Don't forget Syria. Don't forget many other places. So, that will be my answer to this. And yes, uh, so let's not just concentrate on one, uh, so to speak, lobby. There are many of them. You have to go again to the Quincy Institute and uh, uh, on website and see the article about who is the main, actually, uh, manipulator and main lobbyist beating even Saudi Arabia and Israeli lobby. Guess what? In the last several years, it's Ukraine and it beats them by a huge margin. So that will be my answer to this question because, you know, the world is a complex place, okay? And so the last one. You say that Russia is done with the West and wants a new Iron Curtain. Presumably, it follows that Russia will eventually seize all trade with Western countries. Would that be your expectation? When will this happen and why does Russia continue to supply its enemies with valuable goods? I am quite sure that an awful lot of people are puzzled by this continuation of trade in the face of open hostility. Well, there is an open hostility, no doubt about it. But first, pure humanitarian reason. Russians do not want to be responsible for, indeed, many thousands of deaths of Europeans and those people who will die inevitably once Russia shuts off completely its uh, uh, supply. And I already kind of discussed a little bit about this uh, Polish situation today. So, but secondly, uh, I will just repeat what I said in the beginning. Uh, West, combined West, is financing Russian uh, uh, special military operation in Ukraine and other Russian military operations precisely because it needs Russian resources. It cannot reject them. It cannot do anything about it. And that is why it's being forced to pay how Russia wants. And hey, if my enemy pays me to defeat it, to defeat my enemy, why should I refuse? This is a perfect arrangement and that's what drives them, you know, completely nuts. So in this case, Russia will continue as long the, as the contracts uh, exist and as long as the conditions of the contracts are, are fulfilled by the customers in the West, Russia will continue to deliver, say, gas, oil, and, you know, uh, other resources. Hey, if it's paid, 
of course we already know that's the way the uh, trade is set up and the way it is uh, uh, being paid you already know it they cannot freeze those uh, assets anymore so and that's my answer to this question and it's fairly uh, conventional actually you know so it's so obvious and yeah that's why it drives them nuts so uh, this is kind of my uh, talk for today, guys, with this uh, uh, Q&A session. And again, we're going to be doing this periodically, you know, from time to time. Uh, but um, as I said, uh, that's uh, everything I needed to talk today about. And I'll talk to you later. And as always, uh, you know, those who can afford support me on Patreon, please, and subscribe to my channel and um have the nice uh, rest of the week and i'll talk to you later guys bye bye